Well, I'll get that one. I'll get that yeah, one. Yeah, which one you want? Okay, hello. Welcome to another episode of your Jog Pod. Um, today, we're going to be looking at the second side of the distinctive landscapes. Um, again, it's going to be uh, Mr. Unite and Mr. Sahai joining you and delivering this particular section. Hello, Mr. Sahai. Hiya. Uh, looking forward to the case studies. Yeah, excellent. So we'll try and get this one again nice and con concise. Okay, so as you know, there's already a um, case study one uh, that Mr. Hatchell done. So when we get to Walton Nays and the River Tees, your case studies, we'll give them a brief overview. But otherwise, we're going to try and make sure we really go into the detailed part of those uh, rivers and coast sections. So think about the features that are created and management roles and things like that as well. So we're going to start off in this top left hand corner where we sort of previous uh, job pod, we got to that stage of transportation where, you know, weathering and erosion occur sort of at the same sort of time. But obviously, as we said, in situ is weathering. So in one place, but the erosion can be happening during uh, rivers and uh, our coast or anywhere where there is water. So what we want to think about now is once that's been transported, well, what happens when a river or a sea loses its energy? Well, it's going to drop that material, whatever it's been carrying, whether that be sand, rock particles or pebbles. And that's what we're really thinking about in terms of the term deposition. In the same way that you deposit money in a bank, it means to drop material off. And in terms of coast, okay, we looked at one particular key thing. Okay, We talked about how longshore drift, which is a form of transportation, and deposition will help to create um, our coastal spits. OK, so some key words really are things that I would really get you to focus on here. You know, even just looking at that picture, I can see words such as prevailing wind. So our strongest, most common direction of the wind, which is going to drive this whole process. We've got angle. So the angle at which uh, our sort of um, waves are being pushed up and our material is moving up and down the beach. We've got zigzag. We've got um, what else have we got on there? We've got estuary. We've got sheltered bay, etc. So just some key terms along with swash and backwash for you to think about. So I'm going to quickly run through the six main steps again, okay, try and use my mouse to try and identify them on the diagram that you can see. So as I said, our prevailing wind is our strongest direction. So that is going to create waves. In those waves, OK, it's going to be the sediment, whether that's being rolled through traction or whether it's going to be suspended and bring that material up the beach. Material that is brought up the beach is called swash. OK, and that occurs at a nice sort of straight uh, an angle with our prevailing wind as we come up. OK. What happens then, obviously our waves go out and gravity in that sort of slope nature of our beach will help that material to roll back down, okay? And this will be a 90 degree angle to that coastline. And it's why when you sometimes go swimming along the coast, you'll find that naturally when you're going swimming, you move up and down because it's always moving that water at those degree angles, okay? So in effect, that swash moving onto the beach and the backwash moving back out creates a zigzag movement. And that's really what we mean when we talk about longshore drift. And this continues over time and it will move material from one part of the beach down to the other end. What we then find, though, is naturally our uh, prevailing wind may change direction. It might stop or we might have other factors at hand. And that basically simply means that we might have deposition where our energy is not sufficient to keep that going. And once we find there is we start to find that our spit starts to build up, as you can see in this image here. And that roll of the wind, etc., can also change the shape of our spit and we get a recurved spit potentially there. As that wind changes, and obviously we have an estuary, so we've got a river coming down from the source, okay, all the way down into this lower course of the river, is that obviously it's trying to float out to the sea as well, but suddenly it hits this barrier here. So we find that the water again loses energy, and again it deposits material here, and that can help to create what's called salt marshes and sometimes mud flat mud flats behind our spit. OK, so some nice quick recaps, a few key terms there. And there's another few features such as a tombolo that when you go back through your notes and things like that, maybe on BBC Bite Size, there's another form of revision um, you might find out about. So, Mrs. Hi, that's deposition. Anything to, to mention on coastal spits? Otherwise, well, we'll have a quick look at bays and headlands. Yeah, no, absolutely classic piece of uh, job there. OK, it's really worth learning it. OK, and using that terminology. If you get the chance to exam, put those words in. Prevailing winds, they're the direction from which the, the winds used to blow. Swash, backwash, use those terms in your answers, okay? Otherwise, there's your deposition, okay? Great example, a spit. Now, formation of bays and headlands. Again, we're thinking about the difference in resistance of rock here, and it's really straightforward. If you've got a headland, it's sticking out. So it's going to be more resistant rock, okay? It's going to be a hard rock. Whereas if we've got a bay, it's going to be softer rock and it can be eroded away. Now, with the bay, you often find beach material building up there. 
because it's being eroded, it will form the front of it. It also traps it's more sheltered. The headland gets the rough water. You'll see the uh, the waves churning off there, okay? So it's really important you understand the, uh, the the idea of hard and soft rock. Remember, they're all relative to each other, one slightly harder than the other one. That's the one which is going to stick out, okay? And obviously, that's going to take a lot of erosion. You'll find features on there, which we're about to discuss in a second on the left-hand side, uh, which are associated with that erosional uh, forms of uh, coastline. And then obviously the bay itself is where you find the bits where we like to go on holiday, where the beach builds up and it's more sheltered. Should we go across to the uh, the diagram of the... Uh... Yeah, excellent, sir. Um, so one of the other terms that some of the students have seen is discordant and, and concordant. Um, I think that will fit in nicely to where you're going with the formation of a, a coastal stack, but I've definitely seen those words mentioned. But, but I'll let you crack on. Do you see what I did there, sir? Yes, crack, I get that. Yeah, crack on. Excellent. Oh, yeah, anyway, God. over to you, sir. Right then, there's a real good sequence here of... Um, erosional features that you need to remember okay and if you can remember this diagram and sketch it out then you'll be able to remember what's going on but again we need to use terminology to describe it so first up before anything happens we need to have a little bolt or a little crack in the rock where we can get hydraulic action attacking that cliff face remember hydraulic action the compression of that wave banging against that cliff okay compressing it and breaking it down now that crack will quickly open up and then once it can get in there you can get abrasion happening even attrition material chuck it in there possibly solution all the ones we talked about in the last job pod and it'll open up as a cave a cave dark wet damp but it won't stop there it will keep attacking it and over time we're not talking overnight we're talking over uh, possibly hundreds of years it will keep working through it might actually be attacked from the other side as well if it's headland sticking out that i've just mentioned and once it gets through then we're going to get the classic arch now the arch is obviously where you can go all the way through that headland and you can see right through and it's an incredible feature to think how that's been made but of course it won't just stop like that and this is where we need to think about other form of processes taking place so although we've had erosion from the sea attacking it there then we also get weathering taking place it's breaking down the rock above it okay it's making it's weakening it so again it might be biological weathering where rabbits and puffins are nesting in the side of it uh, and obviously it could be getting wet and we might start to see some movement of material falling down over time that weight of that arch will mean uh, it will eventually collapse it will get weakened by weathering and obviously it will collapse down into the sea below uh, so the arch then changes into something called a stack which is basically a pillar of uh, headland that isn't attached anymore and it's left behind and again the erosion will keep going on we haven't got a picture of it uh, but essentially that stack is only supported okay by what's at the bottom the waves will attach and create little notches will actually attack the base where it can reach up to and it will essentially weaken the base until at last the stack will fall and you'll be left with a stump now these are wonderful features down on the, the south coast in it the old harry rocks the example that used there uh, and this is where we get the concept of the different co coastlines at which the rocks are coming at different angles okay and that's important for the type of weathering that takes place it's discordant okay etc you're going to find your uh, headlands and base if it's concordant it's, it's uh, in line okay so the same band of rock in place in the uh, the, uh, uh, the the incoming waves and the failing winds and that influences the type of features that we actually find have you got anything else, Mr. Unite? No, that's really good. I think the only thing was there was that, that other term, wave, wave oh, complex. Yeah. It might have been where I just closed the window because I felt someone was going past. So uh, did you just cover that term at all, wave cut platform? No, I didn't mention that. So the wave cut platform is obviously where, that's where basically can, the um, waves can attack the surface. And obviously you get a platform because the waves are attacking the top part and they'll they'll wear away, okay? They can take that um, stump out and just leave a flat platform which has worn it all away. And they're quite distinctive um, where you see those outcrops of rock just above uh, the uh, sea level where you can see them stretching out. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Right. OK, so and um, we're almost done, really. We've got sort of one sort of final section. Otherwise, uh, obviously, we've got our case study at the end. But the other final thing we start to think about is how we then maybe try to protect ourselves from those processes of erosion. OK, so we think about something called coastal engineering, of which there are two types, hard engineering and soft engineering. Um, the brief difference between them, okay, we'll delve down into them in a little bit more detail, is that hard engineering is typically man-made structures. We aim to stop or reduce the amount of erosion that is occurring. Okay, so there's natural process. We try to protect from erosion, but we also try to reduce the risk of flooding and things like that in the coastal area. 
soft engineering is generally where we might try to work with natural processes okay so we'll talk about those in more detail later but that's a big key difference okay we're generally trying to work with nature we're not necessarily building structures whereas hard engineering is that physical construction of uh, material in particular you've probably seen groins and sea walls groins being those general wooden materials that are built along a beach that essentially stop the process or sort of prevent longshore drift so that our be beach increases in size obviously that then means that in when erosion occurs it's eroding that beach and not the cliff face that is behind so what you really need to know for these sections okay is the general reason about or how they work you know what does a, a groin do what process does it stop what does it do what does it look like and then some advantages and disadvantages so i'll give you some brief overview of each of them um, but i won't go into too much detail because they're quite nice ones for you to delve back into your notes look at things like costs and stuff like that in a bit more detail okay but as we said with those groins okay it means that we can still get to the beach and that positive size of that increase in the beach is obviously for tourism as well but obviously if we're stopping longshore drift then all the that material that would be moving further down the coast suddenly becomes trapped in that one location so we actually find that further down the coast our erosion increases and we definitely see that later on in your water non -Nade case study those sea walls, obviously big concrete walls, which break up the energy of the wave and often are now curved, okay? So some things off that, okay, so obviously if they're made of concrete, they're very expensive, but they have a long lifespan and they're definitely very effective at reducing that erosion and in particular, protecting the land behind from flooding. On the flip side, you can also make sure that they can have like, um, other uses along the top, okay? So people often might find that you can look out to see those little slot machines and stuff like that. So they obviously incorporated into sort of the, the beach environment quite often. But some of the downsides, obviously they're pretty ugly. You don't go to a beach and go, oh, that's an amazing seawall. And also that curved shape can encourage erosion of the beach deposits that are around there as well. Okay, so it fits that energy back onto the beach and can actually cause more erosion potentially. So gabions or riprap, okay, so we've got sort of two things here, okay, riprap can be um, large boulders that we place out on the sea, potentially in front of either a sea wall or in front of a cliff face already, okay, and we often get most of ours out from, from Norway quite often, where they've got really hard, like igneous type, type rock, which lasts a long time and really break down the power of the waves, reducing the, the, the amount of erosion that occurs. Um, gabions, okay, are basically cages of rocks. And actually, interestingly, quite a lot of my, my students have seen gabions next to motorways because they're basically cages of rock that allow water and other materials to sort of flow through them. And because they're multiple smaller rocks and they've got gaps between them, it reduces the energy in that sense, okay? So rather than just one big solid rock getting the full power, it actually breaks it down a little bit more naturally. So they can be really powerful in that, in that sense. But what's really useful is obviously in terms of gabions, well, they're much cheaper. They're basically, you just gather the rocks that are potentially already there or within the local area, and you stick them in a metal cage. So we can make sure that we're using the same rock type so that it doesn't look different uh, like a seawall does to the rest of the environment but the problem with both of these is eventually they're both going to um, break down riprap in particular often has to come from other countries so we've got that that importing nature but also gabions will naturally need replacing because they will corrode over time as water salt seawater in particular with all that salt will break down those in particular so as you said soft engineering is all about working sort of with nature okay so naturally we could just pick out sand from other areas that don't necessarily need to be protected and add them so where we nourish ourselves in terms of food vitamins nutrients etc we can bring that sand and put it onto a new existing beach which is obviously significantly cheaper it creates a beach which has the economic benefits but on the flip side of that we might find that we either get the sand from other areas that then become more protected or we take that sand from offshore and as we dredge as you remember we talk about this a little bit later in your river section where we get a big digger and we take that sand from off the coast etc or within the, the rivers etc and we put that back onto the land it obviously damages that um, natural sort of seabed that's already there so the ecosystem that's built up there can be potentially damaged as a result of that and obviously you need to do it quite regularly because longshore drift and storms will easily move that material away in terms of managed retreat well we've got a general idea that you call um, uh, sort of defending uh, defending the line okay or holding the line in terms of hard engineering but soft engineering is where we might retreat the line, okay? And in, in a sense, okay, we allow that the land to take over our least important areas. So maybe it was previous farmland that is low value. And we go, well, once it floods, we can let that area flood and we might even remove existing defenses. So if this area floods, in terms of the water, it goes to an area that is lower value. 
and therefore it doesn't impact on um, settlements, people, areas or infrastructure that are more important. In essence, okay, the key positive and negatives of that, obviously it reduces flood risk, but if we suddenly create these new areas, we might find salt marshes. And as a result of that, people like the RSPB, people that want to go bird watching, will find nice new natural habitats being created. The one downside, obviously we need to compensate the farmers, the people who owned the land beforehand, that might now lose their land at certain times of year or on a permanent basis. So that concludes that part of um, sort of our coastal section here. We'll come back to the case study of Wharton on Lays a little bit later. Um, but otherwise, we're going to start to look at with Mr. Sahai the upper course of a river and the type of features we might find, such as waterfalls within them. So, Mr. Sahai, upper yeah. course of a river for us. What okay. we got? So a river basically takes its route from its upper part right down to the lower course. And basically you need to understand how it changes as it goes down through that route. Now the upper course of the river is right at the start where the source of the river is. So it's usually gonna be a lot higher up. It's gonna be possibly up in the hills and the mountains, uh, definitely somewhere boggy where it can start to collect that water uh, before it will start to let that water flow down through its system. So remember, we've got lots and lots of tributaries feeding into the river that part, okay? It's gonna be very wet. Now in the upper course of the river, uh, the river, all the energy is trying to rope downward. Okay, it's up higher than sea level, so the energy is trying to cut downwards into uh, the landscape underneath it. So, what we get there are valley form, where basically it's cut downwards and then it creates a V shape as the, as the sides um, fall in, they weather and they drop in, and the materials carried away. And we have distinctive narrow valleys, okay, V shaped because uh, the river's cutting downwards. We might find the river has to go round some harder rock, okay, so we might have interlocking spurs, which basically are, are fingers of harder rock, where the river just does not have enough energy to cut through it, so it goes around it. Now, in the upper course of the river, we're likely to find lots of unique features, but one you've got to really understand is the concept of a waterfall, and, and a water leading to the concept of a gorge. So we've got a diagram there, which you can see. The key thing for you to look at is, again, the relationship between harder and softer rock. That's what's so important about a waterfall. Remember, it's harder rock on top, it's more resistant, it's therefore protecting the softer rock underneath. But if it can get through down to that softer rock, which you can see as the water flows over the edge of that harder rock, then it's going to erode that softer rock at a faster rate. Now, this is crucial because, again, we've got to think about our terms in terms of erosion. What we get is undercutting. So undercutting of the hard rock, okay, is that it will take the soft rock from underneath it, undercuts underneath there, through again all your processes, hydraulic action, abrasion, attrition, possibly even solution, depending on that rock. All of that is adding up, cutting it backwards underneath there. Now as it cuts it back, that material is then taken away, it ends up in the plunge pool, uh, which is at the bottom as the uh, river goes over. Uh, the edge of the waterfall and that plunge pool then allows rock to rub against each other to break into smaller pieces before it gets carried along through transportation but of course it's ammo for the river to then create further erosion now as that waterfall cuts back what will happen is the undercutting will mean the hard rock will collapse and fall into that plunge pool and essentially the waterfall will move back through the landscape and it leaves a really steep sided um gorge which is basically a valley with steep sides straight up uh, along the side a very distinctive uh, feature so that's the, the the upper part you might find some human activity in the upper part of the pool such as uh, looking for to build a dam because obviously got lots of water you've got the, the size there we can trap it uh, but obviously these are natural features which are being created as you go down there now the material in the river is going to be pretty big it's going to be angular and sharp it hasn't had any time to smooth down so it's large unsorted big material okay and as i said all the energy is trying to cut down with you rather than going along Right, as we move down though, we'll go further down. So we're going down the course of the river now and we get to the middle course. Now the middle course is where you start to see a change, okay? It might open out a bit. You might see up to see more farming and more use of the land. In the upper course, it's gonna be pretty inaccessible. It's where you'll find sheep farming and some, some sorts of farm like that, but very little land use apart from that. As you get into the, the middle course, the river starts to get a bit more space and it starts to open up. Now remember, water is being added to that river all the way down. It's collecting it from its um, from the whole drainage basin, feeding it in through lots of tributaries, possibly a confluence of two rivers, make it even bigger. All that water, though, means that the river starts to change. So rather than cutting downwards now, as it starts to get a bit further down and close to sea level, the water now starts to go from side to side, and you get lateral erosion. Okay, so lateral erosion is the movement of water from side to side. And obviously that side to side movement then starts to create erosion and deposition in different areas there. 
Now, one of the classic features that you'll find in the top right-hand corner is the idea of an oxbow lake, okay, which forms after you've got a series of meanders. So first of all, we've got to understand what a meander is. So a meander is basically a bend in the river, okay, which is caused by the river, snake from side to side. Um, it's unlike to ever go in a straight line, so you always get a bit of movement. But the movement gets accentuated because as the water moves to the outside of the bend, you get erosion occurring there. Think of it, if you go around with a car and you're about to beat and everyone gets squeezed together as you go around a corner very quickly, that movement, that momentum okay, of weight of you guys moving to the side of the car is the same momentum of that water pushing to the outside of the bend. And you get the same principles there happening where you've got erosion, okay, you're going to see the bank being undercut. So undercutting occurring where it's going to wear it away at a faster rate. It can also mean that that will collapse and take that material away. But where you've got all that activity happening on the outside of the bend is very different on the inside of the bend. On the inside of the bend, the water has decreased because it's all pushed to the outside and it actually slows down. So you get deposition on the inner side of um, the bend. Now, this is crucial because it's this idea that the outside of the bend is eroding at a faster rate than the inside, which accentuates that uh, bend even further. As we go into step two, you can see from the like, little handy mouse going around. You I can try to be helpful, sir. <laughs> Sorry. But it's starting to tighten, okay? You can see the bends moving out, okay, towards us. But also, you've got two outer bends where the arrows are going around. So you can see where they're starting to meet together. Now, the concept of that idea is you get a swan's neck where it starts to get closer and closer. Basically, two outer uh, bends coming towards each other, okay? And that constant erosion means that during a time where we might have a bit of uh, extra water, so flood conditions, the river might, in step three, find a new route through, which is just to go over the top between those two bends to link up. Now, once that happens once, obviously the water can erode it and create a new faster channel. And what you get is a new channel being taken and you get the old meander being left behind. It's cut off and you get a new route of the river. So the last step of step four is that meander has been cut off. You can see the old meander and it's left as a horseshoe shaped uh, lake, which is called an oxbow lake. Another classic um, river feature. Now, this is in the middle into the lower section of the river, um, river profile. You're going to find this. And as we go further along, okay, the snaking off the meanders across the, uh, the floodplain will cut it and make it nice and flat. Okay, It's going to remove material. It's going to resort it. It's going to create a nice flat floodplain. So the very lowest part of uh, the river are the flat plains, okay, where it's easiest for us to build houses. Flat land is a lot easier to build on than any form of slope. But also importantly, we find really rich alluvial soils. The soil has been created by flooding, where the, the particles of, of soil and material have been worn out of the, the, the valley floor further up, get deposited, okay, when the river floods, and that silt then provides excellent farming. So you get the best crops growing in those sort of areas. And don't forget, you've also got a water source close by, so they're not short of that. Now, floodplains have developed over hundreds and thousands of years of uh, a river snaking across. So the floodplains where we live on now, okay, haven't just sprung up, okay, they're a natural feature that's taken time for it. Now along um, the lower course, you'll also find these banks called natural levees, okay. Now levees are the banks which build up on either side of the river, which might keep it slightly higher than the surrounding land. Now if you think about a river flooding, okay, it's when it cannot, when the river cannot be contained within the channel, it will obviously spread out into the floodplain. As a massive clue, it's called the floodplain for a reason. Naturally, a river will look to spread out and use those areas either side. But as it does it, as soon as that river comes out of the channel, it loses a lot of energy. And it always deposits its biggest material first. Okay, The heaviest stuff is dumped first. And that's what builds up these natural levees. Okay, Essentially, banks on either side of the river built up um, by the river flooding itself. And it kind of gives it a bit more capacity, but obviously it's very distinctive to have those levees either side. Okay. Mr. Knight, can you think of anything else? No, that's really good, sir. I think you've, you've gone through those three courses of the river really, really nicely. So um, they've definitely got some good notes in their book. You know, I know the lessons that we've got that break them down really nicely, that show a river profile and sort of key characteristics about it. So again, you know, go back through your notes, use other revision materials to try and, you know, build up on the on these key points. But Mr. Hyde's done a great job of picking out the absolute key essentials that we need. So thank you very much for that, sir. So yeah, just remember about the different types of views as well, because uh, you could get uh, be asked for a cross-sectional diagram, which is obviously where you look through the side of the river. So it's like a cake you cut down. If you were to do that with a meander, you'd obviously see where you've got the outside of the bend. It would be deeper, you could mark on the undercutting, and then it gets shallower as you go to the inside of the bend and get a slip-off slope where you get material um, um, being deposited. 
So that'd be a cross-sectional diagram. And then one where you're looking down is a bird's eye view. So if you're just looking down, like the diagram's really in the top, a bird's eye view looking down, okay? So just be aware they might look for different types of diagrams uh, within a question. Yeah, nice to remember. So that's a good, good one to point out. So um, as we talked about earlier, okay, we've got soft engineering, hard engineering. So just a brief recap, soft engineering aims to work with sort of processes and most importantly, it doesn't involve the building of, you know, hard structures. Hard engineering does, and it's all about reducing that potential risk. Um, so effectively in terms of river, well, how do we try and reduce the risk associated with rivers? Well, my first one, okay, I'll correct this for you because then there's two little uh, accidental mistakes that we've got here. So it should say plants and trees soak up, not sock up, rainwater, which reduces our flood risk. So the opposite of deforestation, afforestation means we have more trees, more vegetation, obviously through their roots, soak up the rainwater, which means it's less water adding to the capacity of that river. But it also helps like in the rainforest to intercept you know, on its uh, leaves and, and other parts of the, the plant, which also, if you think about a flood hydrograph, something else you probably might be looking at as, as part of your revision, and helps to slow down that, that rate that the water will uh, arrive at the river, helping to reduce that flood risk. We can also use demountable flood barriers. So simply, rather than there being a, a permanent um, fixture and therefore having that negative impact of impacting on the landscape, you know, even if we think back to that first part of distinctive landscapes, you know, that, that idea that we want places to look nice and look natural. Well, we can just use demountable flood barriers that we put up only when that warning is raised. So very effective, but at the same time, that nice environmental benefit as well. So managed flooding, we can also choose, like that managed retreat, let areas flood, protecting certain settlements. So as Mr. Sahai was talking about, we know that there might be certain areas of floodplains either side. We might choose to let certain places in the same way that managed retreat does for coastline, to let those less important, less valuable areas to flood. OK, so again, they're not necessarily in as much detail here. OK, these are general brief summaries. So like the section earlier, what you really want to be thinking about is, you know, what are the advantages and disadvantages of these methods? OK, so don't forget as part of your vision to make sure you're deepening your understanding of these as well. OK, what we also might do is a bit like that, that meander earlier. You know, if we think about, you know, it going away from being nice and curvy to really, really straight. Well, what might that might mean is obviously the water passes through areas much faster. OK, so it helps us to remove flood water in that immediate area, because rather than spending time meandering its way around the, the sort of the lower course, um, it can get out of the area and away from settlements as quickly as possible. As Mr. Sahai talked about with the, the, the levees uh, before, OK, we can also try to make artificial ones, you know, where a river makes that quite naturally in areas where it hasn't made those. We can naturally heighten the, the river there and try to sort of create that natural river bank, which helps to increase the capacity of our river, therefore potentially reducing that risk because you can hold more water before it does flood. Obviously, a downside is eventually once it does break, if it's got more water, then we do potentially make that flooding worse worse but again we can also use that process of dredging which came up earlier and we might even dig out and deepen and widen our river again this might increase that capacity of flood we can have more capacity but again like we said for beach nourishment earlier if we're dredging that bottom of that river you know plants and animals fish all of it you know within that ecosystem have got used to it being in that way so if we remove that then it has a significant impact on that ecosystem and habitat so some nice ideas as well there where we started to bring in the ideas of leveling up our knowledge by starting to think about social, economic, environmental, and potentially even political points of view. Okay, so we're down to the last two case studies of this course. So just as a reminder, these are done in detail on Mr. Hatchell's um, job pod where he goes through the case studies really quickly. But I'm just going to do a quick, maybe, I don't know, I'm going to try 60 seconds to 90 seconds quick recap of, of Walton on the Nays, and then I'll hand over to Mr. Zahai to again do a quick, you know, 90 seconds on the River Tees, just drawing upon the really key information for you. So I'm going to try and do 90 seconds, I reckon, are probably about, about right. OK, so Walton and Nays we find in Essex. OK, we talk about it as a rural coastal area that is quite popular with tourists um, for things such as obviously its coastline and the Nays Tower. So in pictures you should easily recognise uh, from your lessons. Why do we look at it? Well, we look at it for the geomorphic processes, those natural geo-earth processes, morph like to change, and we talked about metamorphic rock earlier, that change the landscape. So really here we think about how weathering, and erosion impact on that landscape at Walton on the Nays. Most importantly, okay, this comes from the idea that it suffers from coastal erosion and that there is management there. 
The most important part is the type of rock that we find at Walton and Nays. These are London clay and red, cra red crag. And these rocks are easily eroded. Um, so they have really fast rates of erosion. If you look back again at your notes, I know you've got a little A5 case study sheet in your book, you'll find some nice information about how the rates of erosion have changed over time. So really key, there's erosion, weathering, um, mass movements such as slumping going on, as well as longshore drift. So we really wanna really go into detail about understanding what processes go on at water maze and how do they shape that coastline. Again, more information in your case study booklet and on the job pod with Mr. Hatchell. But essentially what we do look at then is in terms of how we have tried to manage it and water on maze. Some key things for you to think about is to try and reduce that risk of slumping, which is all about, you know, permeable rock taking on water, becoming heavy and being undercut. Well, they introduce water drainage systems, uh, it increased the amount of groins that are there to build up the size of the beach. In 1998, 300 tons of granite were placed near the tower, which is a key tourist destination, which helped to further reduce the erosion of those cliffs. And again, a soft engineering for you to learn here would be a nice uh, way to look at how beach replenishment, so we would keep topping up the beach with material to help reduce the impact of erosion. So some nice things here. The reason why I might pick these three out is one, we can link it to uh, the process of weathering, Okay, and uh, mass movement in terms of the water drainage and slumping. We've got a nice example of how we reduce erosion through uh, granite and how also beach replenishment can try to uh, deal with the impact of longshore drift and erosion. Okay, so like I said, more detail available elsewhere. I think I probably went over about 90 seconds, but I think maybe two minutes max there. So, yeah, Mr. Sahai, what are the key points that we need to really bear in mind and apply from stuff we talked about for the river tees? Okay, so the river tees. It's really important you just get the factual information. So know where it is. It's in the north of England, and it sources up in the Pennines. Okay, so that's the, the upper course, and it flows down to the lower course where it exits out at Red Car into the North Sea. So remember, everything we talked about, the upper, middle, and lower course. Um, high Force Waterfall is the name of a waterfall along the River Tees, and you can talk about the harder windstone rock as opposed to the softer um, limestone rocks underneath it. Okay, so you can actually name rocks and actually uh, show your – case study knowledge of a waterfall on there okay and again you've got a beautiful gorge which is formed behind it in the middle part we've got the meandering we've got the oxbow lakes and we've got a settlement called yarm okay where it's got the meanders going around it okay makes it very picturesque but to prevent um erosion and flooding more importantly uh, they've straightened some of those meanders to try and get the water to go from point a to point b quicker than following it around there to try and save that and as we go further down into the lower course we get to where we've got a lot of uh, industry, okay? Some big heavy industry down there. And obviously it's important that they you know, dredge the river, okay? So dredging is where you dig out and you make the channel deeper, but you get another wind because when they dig the material out, they put it onto the sides and build up the levees, okay? So they build up the capacity of the river. So they want to do that, obviously, to get the river flow increasing, but also they have quite big boats coming up through there. And then finally, we have got some big areas in Middlesbrough. Uh, one of the big systems there is the Tees Barrage, okay, which controls the flow rate beyond that part. Same for like a mini uh, reservoir, uh, sorry, a mini dam that doesn't really have the reservoir where they control everything at that part. Also in the upper course, we've got Cow Green, which is a reservoir, which, is, which uh, creates a uh, store of water for those sediments I've mentioned, okay, and also provides the ultimate control over the river beyond that point. Remember, these are all very expensive schemes, hard engineering, and a lot of money spent there. And then finally, head of flood warning systems. You know, got flood line, we've got flood line where people can find out about the risk of flooding in their area. And also the concept that, you know, people need to live with it more. Insurance companies are asking people to uh, devise the houses so they can evacuate, so they can cope with it, to try and minimise the cost and the impacts, which are really important as well. Is that enough? Yeah, that was wicked, sir. Nice and concise, possibly more concise than mine. So I think you nailed that. So as we said, you know, a nice quick overview of some of the more detailed parts um, of the distinctive landscapes unit, looking at both rivers and coasts. Okay, so keep up that revision as much as you can. Remember, keep going back through other revision materials, such as case study booklet, other jog pods, but don't forget your book. You know, we know we've got loads of really good diagrams of things like meanders um, within your books and, you know, that, that cross profile of the river in there as well. So don't forget those other sources. But otherwise, thank you very much for joining us today, and we hope that that was of benefit to you. Yeah, take care.